Connecticut's independent party has an entire slate of candidates for just about every race out there. Today, we speak with Tom Marsh. He's the independent candidate for governor. Also, Ann Brickley is the Republican challenging Congressman John Larson. We are going to hear about her plan to take his seat coming up. And Jack Archuli is looking to be Connecticut's next state comptroller. He has a plan to reduce state spun spending. You're watching The Real Story. I'm Lori Perez. Today, we are glad to have on the show Tom Marsh, the first selectman from Chester, who is running as an independent for governor. Joining me to talk to Tom about his plans for the state is Christine Stewart of the enormously popular news site, Connecticut News Junkie. Thank you, both of you, for being here. Tom, if we could just start off with, um, you know, do you think that an independent governor would have the ability uh, to work with a legislature that's largely going to be made up, obviously, of the, of the major parties? I think in our current situation we have a better opportunity to because we've seen that the extreme partisanship we've over the last couple of sessions has, has really not worked. And I do believe that there are quite a few legislators that in their gut are in the middle, but they don't have leadership that will take them there. And I think we're going to need to build consensus from the middle. And since I don't have a party that I have to adhere to, uh, I think I'm going to be able to show, bring that leadership and bring some folks to the middle from both parties. We've, um, you know, we've all seen the statistics that 42 percent of the people who are registered in Connecticut are unaffiliated or they're registered as an independent. I mean, certainly if you could tap into all of those people and make them vote independent, you would have this thing wrapped up. Yep. Um, how, what role do you think that these voters are going to have in determining who's going to be the next governor? Well, as we've seen in last November's election, and I'm sure we're going to see this time around, the unaffiliated and independent voters are going to be those that make the difference. Uh, I believe the Republican Party is at around 22 or 23 percent registration, and the, and the Democrats are in the you know, mid to upper 30s. So they can't win if they only appeal to their constituencies. And... I'm particularly encouraged in looking at the primary results that, you know, both of the so-called major parties, one candidate got 50,000 votes, one got 100,000 votes, that there's a lot of opportunity there, and the unaffiliated and independents are going to make the difference. Right. Can you talk a little bit about why you switched? I mean, you had started the race out as a Republican, and then you switched to independent, and what kind of challenges that presents with it? Well, the reason for the switch is I had some history. In the, in the last municipal elections, I helped some local folks uh, form a third party. It's called the Common Ground Party in Chester, and it was specifically designed to get away from the partisan politics. I, I was elected there as a Republican three times in a, in a town that only has a 25 percent Republican uh, registration. And it's because at the local level you vote you know, for the party, much more so the person. When I, when I got involved in the gubernatorial race, I was attending town committee meetings along with all the other candidates, and I just saw the rhetoric that we were uh, uh, expressing. And looking at how serious the problems are, the rhetoric on the left or the right is not going to solve the problems, and it was just a very uncomfortable fit for me. I really think we need to be focused on good governance. And in a debate that was broadcast back in March, the Independent Party watched and, and approached me because they felt comfortable with my message and the more I learned about them and the differences they've made where they have elected officials I felt very comfortable uh, in their shoes and in, in, in their uh, uh, way of doing politics and I thought it was a, a, a better move. Have you been able to retain uh, the supporters that you had when you were still when you were with the Republicans? You know, I've, I've had a number of folks you know, it ranges from don't do it, you're, you're going to throw the Republicans under the bus, to why did you do it, you seem to have a future in the Republican Party. Uh, and I think that they're still going to, I think I'm going to have quite a bit of support from those that have seen me along the way. The point is, I wasn't looking to be somebody in the Republican Party. I got involved locally because the town had some problems and I thought I could help. Mm -hmm. At this level, I really think that the state needs the perspective of a municipal leader that represents small business, I own a small business, and a town that matches about 75% of the profile of the other towns. I think my perspective is important. It's not because I have a desire to be governor. Mm -hmm. I have a desire to help. Mm -hmm. Probably the biggest problem the state is going to be facing is the $3.4 billion deficit. How, as governor, would you solve that? <laughs> I, anything I say, I'll, <laughs> I'll provide a caveat that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult along the way. But we're going to have to, uh, add, uh, on the revenue side, uh, where the, the, the core of my, my proposal is to evaluate every exemption that we have, whether it's the uh, property uh, tax credit all the way down to why do car washes get a, a, an exemption from sales tax, and say let's pull out those ones 
that aren't fair, don't make any sense, and bring those revenue streams in. And what my expectation is, is as we grow out of this, we'll maybe be able to bring down the overall sales or income tax rates because we have a broader participation. On the other end, I do think everybody needs to have some skin in the game. And I think everybody should have to pay, even if it's a little bit, even if it's a dollar or two a week. People need to be engaged in the process, and I think we need a broader base to our tax system. On the spending side, we spend plenty of money. We just don't spend it very well. And I think at least what I've done locally is we focus on quality, excellence, and value in no matter what we do. And what state government seems to do is focus on who's going to do what, where, when, and then you get very territorial. And we have horrible outcomes. So I think we're going to be able to restructure government, bring the number of commissions down, bring down the associated employment from the top down, from the patronage jobs down to some of the rank and file. I think we're going to streamline it. But I want to work with labor to get the best people in the best places to provide the best service. But if we could talk about this, uh, if you talk about reducing exemptions, right, for small businesses or businesses in general, mm -hmm. I mean, won't that add to the whole atmosphere of what people think of Connecticut as uh, not business friendly and they think it's so expensive to be here? You pass them an exemption, maybe they'll be enticed to stay or come? Well, I, I think in a, in a very general way, exemptions or incentives provide a false economy. And we've seen time and time again where we've thrown money at a segment of uh, the economy or an employment sector. The money comes, they take advantage of it, and they leave. What Connecticut needs to be is profitable and um, uh, you've got to be able to be productive here. Mm -hmm. And we're not. And it, that has to do with the structure and the effectiveness of government. When you come and you can't get a, an answer, right or wrong, to your uh, solution, I, I have with me on my website uh, an organizational chart for our energy decision-making structure in Connecticut. And it looks like a bowl of noodles. And it was developed by the, the um, uh, case, the, the Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering, for the legislature asking what does it look like and how can we improve our energy uh, delivery. It's been sitting on the, on the shelf for a year and a half. We need to do everything we do better. The answer is not to give you a dollar to stay here. The answer is to come here because Connecticut is one of the best places in the country to live and then make it so that you can be profitable and productive and enjoy your life here. We have about one minute. Christine, what do you think we should talk about? Um, well, I, would you, I, you talked about exemptions, but would you raise taxes? Uh, the answer is some people are going to pay more and some people are going to pay less. What I, what I will, uh, you know, the, the, the core level, the tax system we have right now is nobody would design this from scratch. It's absolutely arcane. Uh, it, it doesn't focus on raising revenue. A lot of it is socially engineered. So are some people going to pay more? Yes. Are some people going to pay less? I think so. But I think what we're going to have is a tax structure that is more conducive to raising revenue, fairer across the board, and addresses the, the situations that we have. And lastly, if we're going to in, in implement revenue for transportation. That money is going to get spent on transportation. If you're going to buy a fishing license, that money is going to go to the DEP. It's not going to go to something else because nobody likes paying taxes, but they're more willing to pay it if they know that it's going to something that they support. You drive your car, you pay some gas tax, your roads are in good shape. Not that it goes someplace else to get wasted. All right. Thanks a lot. Tom Marsh, he is the independent candidate for governor. I know you're looking to get, hoping to get into a lot of the debates so we can hear a lot more from you. Thanks a lot, Tom, right. for being I here. Appreciate you having me. Up next, business consultant Ann Brickley is here to talk about facing John Larson in the race for Congress.